I flipped the switch. Is it working? <laughs> All right, there we go. Job 42, the final verses. Verses 7 through 17, not even going to read all those today, but I want to look at the last section here that I want to deal with on Job, and that is Job being restored after suffering. Finally, we get to the restoration. You know, uh, God always vindicates his servants. Now, often it's not until we go to be with the Lord in heaven just like Jesus went to the cross, Paul, Peter, all those who gave their lives. So they weren't vindicated on this earth, but they, we will all be vindicated when we go to be with the Lord. But here we're going to see that God restored Job by giving him back his health. He gave him seven sons, three daughters, and double the wealth that he had before. But before God restored Job, restored Job, he accomplished two more things that we want to look at here. So let's read, uh, let me read a few verses, starting with verse 7 of chapter 42. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Now, verses 10 through 17 is actually God restoring Job. Talks about he gave him 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. And it talks about all that God had did, had done for Job. But what we want to look at here today quickly is the two things that God accomplished here right at the end. And again, this is before Job was restored. So he's, he's still covered in boils. Keep that in mind. <laughs> he still looks terrible, feels terrible. But God is going to do two more things. And the first thing he did here that we're going to look at, as we already read in verse 7, he crushed the pride of Job's three friends. But he didn't just do this to sh uh, I'll show you. He did this to restore them. But in order to restore them, their pride had to be crushed. They'd been speaking all these words, you know, as, as we looked at some of them for, for like, you know, 30-some chapters. It goes on and on and on about them speaking. Some things were true but misapplied to Job. Therefore, they were not true in that context. But here we see that God comes to them and tells them, My anger burns against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So he, I want to see that he crushed their pride in order to cleanse them. God tells them that their theology is wrong. What they believe, what you think, it, it's wrong. And the main thing that we've looked at is that the righteous don't always prosper. That was their, that was their main problem. That they believed, okay, you do right, you prosper. So Job, you must have sinned. Your, your kids must have sinned because they were killed in the storm. So they all must have sinned because this has come upon you. So God tells them that your theology is wrong. What you believe is not right. It's not in line with who I am. And then in verse 8, we see that God makes them seek him through Job. They have to take these oxen, they have to uh, offer these sacrifices, go to Job, offer the sacrifice, and then ask Job to pray for them. So I'm not sure how far we can take all that, but we do know one thing. Sometimes to be right with God, you have to get things right with somebody else. Now, they don't always accept it. They're not always going to forgive you. But sometimes you got to go to somebody and get it right before you're going to be restored back to God. And so that's what God required these three friends to do. 
Now then, the second thing is he requires Job to forgive his enemies. Now keep in mind, this Job's still covered in boils. He's still feeling rotten. He still doesn't have sons or wealth or anything like that. He's in a miserable state physically. But Job, or God requires Job to forgive his enemies in verse 9. And it says, it says that the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And Matthew 6, 14 tells us that if you forgive others, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And if you don't, he won't. That's a paraphrase, obviously. But so we need to forgive others in order to be forgiven by God. And so before the boils went away, before Job's body was cleansed and his health was restored, he had to pray for his friends. And that in turn was forgiveness on Job's part to do that to them, for them. And so the three friends are put in their place but not just for the sake of got you in the right place now. Aha, see, you're put in your place. But he does it to restore them. He does it to cleanse their hearts. And then Job, he has to forgive his enemies. Then when all that takes place, then Job is restored. And verses 10 through the end of the chapter 17, verse 17 is all that God blesses Job with. Now just as a quick conclusion to the book of Job, I want to, four things that uh, the suffering of Job has accomplished. Four things. First of all, sin and pride have been purged out of Job and the three friends. But for Job specifically, sin and his inner pride has been purged from Job. This is all a result of God bringing suffering on Job. Secondly, False teaching has been corrected. God corrects the friends. As I put it, the Bible doesn't say it exactly this way, but you have the wrong theology. And so I'm going to show you through Job's suffering, these friends, these three guys, they come into a right relationship with God through Job's suffering. They didn't suffer. They didn't lose any kids. They didn't lose any cattle. They They didn't get sick. But through Job's suffering and then them coming against Job, God brought them into a right relationship. So the false teaching has been corrected. Third thing I want to say is that the unity of God's servants has been restored through suffering. You know, God works through suffering. It's just amazing. There are so many ways. I mean, it's just like if I, if I had a little problem with, with Paul, and then all of a sudden he got deathly ill, I'd be, oh, Brother Paul, you know, look, I'm sorry for, you know, I mean, just if he would suffer, it's like it's going to make me, it's going to make me take a better look at, hey, what am I doing here? What am I doing with this attitude towards him? I, I need to look at my own heart. And so God works through suffering in so many ways, and he brought the unity of these four men back together through suffering. And the last thing, is that you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the book, but the accusations of Satan have been disproven. Amen to that. Glory to God. Satan comes accusing. He comes saying, oh, oh, Job's only serving you because you bless him so much and you're so good to him. And it took all this, months and months, as we've learned, we don't know how many months, but months of suffering, but Satan was disproven and put in his place. And you notice we don't hear from him at the end of the story. So God is good. We're going to trust in the Lord no matter what comes, knowing he is in control. As we read in the book of Job, he covers his hand with lightning and commands it to strike the mark. Not even lightning is random. God is in control. God has a control over everything. So we may not understand it, we may, and it's okay to ask God, God, what's going on here? Why has this come upon me? Or why has this come upon somebody else? It's okay to ask God that, but let's don't accuse him like Satan does. Let's don't accuse him of wrongdoing and let's trust in the Lord and knowing also that we will be vindicated because his holiness will be vindicated one day and we will be with him. Let's pray.
Thank you, Father. You are good all the time. You are God, and your love, your steadfast love, endures forever. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.